you know, something fuzzy. I don't want to make this something mystical. I'm going to make it very clear, Jesus says. In verse, John chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus made it very clear. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hated the light. Neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest. That they are brought in God. We can trust that we come to the light. And this will show us. And it does hurt. I'll be honest with you. It hurts over and over and over again. It hurts. You come and, you know, the analogy you were before, I think the closer you get to the light, you do see more dirt on your hand. But you don't begin to the point where you no longer need that. Oh, how dangerous a place that has to be. But to remember, Jesus said, this is it. This is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, but we will love darkness so we see the revival often times. We see in the revival things. God is coming. God is speaking. Sin is being dealt with. Confession is being made. People are getting right with God. People are getting born again. And in that same passage there, he said to, to, to Nicodemus, totally new. Not just turning over a new leaf. Not just turning over a new leaf, but truly a conversion of their life. But then, no longer sin is dealt with. Then it begins to be a, a bit of a party, a bit of a, a thing. But then you see sometimes in history, no longer sin is dealt with. No longer is holiness brought up. No longer are they even concerned with those things. Those are things of old. I can remember when I first got to a very nominal church that I grew up with. They laughed about the old preacher. They did. They said, yeah, you know, we used to have revival here. And, and they had these contemporary Christians and, and a, a, a bunch of a, 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 um, albums and on those days, albums and rock albums and all these things. And we actually had a barrel burning in the parking lot. And even in the newspaper, I remember just the age of hearing about this. And they said, and they said, it really put the church in a bad light. I remember driving on a bus to one of these big, gigantic youth gatherings and, and hearing them talk about it all. It's much better now. You would believe what it used to be. Oh, God, when we stop dealing with those things, you know, it just puts an end. puts an end to your life. The last point that I would like to bring out in this, these three points, I looked at pride. When I looked through history, it seems that men have been exalted. Institutions have been exalted. Theologies have been exalted. It seems that sin is no longer dealt with. Number two, sin was no longer dealt with. People are the meaning of holy God is no longer dealt with. But number three, is that revival is a means, not a end. And that has to be understood. Brothers and sisters, today, let me ask you something. Pentecost was the birth of what? The church. Pentecost was the birth of the church. Unless the local church comes up there behind it and takes these things and disciples these things, it's not meant for us just to be having a convention. It's not meant for us to have a seminar. Pentecost was not the birth of seminar. Pentecost was not the birth of just big meetings. It was the birth of the church. It was the birth of the church. Jesus once he gave that poured out the Holy Spirit so that these men would take. I'll tell you, one of the, the revivals that, that they have grieved me the most, the ending of this revival has grieved me the most, again, is why I had a particular interest in the Lancaster, Lancaster County, is where I'm from, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and there in the early 1950s and uh, 1940s, even, the Mennonites there, for, for, since a long time, had not done any missions at all, and finally they started being missionaries to, to Africa, and started going to what was Tanganyika, and it's Tanzania now. And they were also in Rwanda and Uganda and all the certain areas. And while they were there, they experienced the revival that was happening there in the, in the early 1940s that was there in Africa. And as they were there, it was interesting. There's no doubt when you read about 
about this early revival. It started back in 1929. An interesting name of a man by uh, a doctor named Joe Church. If you read his history, we can't tell him to go into it right now. But he saw a revival and he began to start it. He was actually uh, having a very poor time in his ministry, went to a retreat center, and there he met another man who said, There's something missing. They began to confess their sin, and once again, just like over and over again, you heard it this week. They started confessing their sin, and God poured out his revival. It went so far and so long that they were staying in Uganda and Rwanda, these places were Christian country. I mean, it was just Is that when I read some of those reports of those people that were trying to plant churches there, they were very arrogant back to saying, well, we're not going to teach anything. We're not going to, we're not just going to let them be led by their own convictions. We're going to let them go here and go there. And, 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 and even one thing I have to, I don't know if I can have any hobby horses today, but you have to appreciate that the Mennonites there in Lancaster would have not been very good about not going to war. And I remember one of the letters, they were saying, we're not going to teach them even those sorts. And, and not resist, we're just going to let them go. Do you know at the end what happened in Rwanda? I think you know, do you? There was a genocide there in 1994, and 800,000 people were killed. They said that in the river between Rwanda and Tanzania, that at times there were 9,000 bodies of dead floating up that river as they were trying to do their racial cleansing of sending these people as they sent back to Egypt. God, when he brings revival, wants to bring in a church that teaches the ways of God. Jesus said, Jesus said, that he wants to, us to go and teach all things that he's given to us. All things. All things. All things. Pentecost was the birth of the church. Was the birth of the church. The idea of, of we sometimes today as preachers, and I've read, I read a recent little book that they were talking about when we get into an area, we need to make sure that we don't, we don't put our convictions on any other. We, we don't want to do that. And I, I disagree with that. I believe as preachers, as ministers of the Word of God, we should speak forth the Word of God, and that brings conviction to someone, as, as the Apostle Paul did. And let me just say something. Do you know that in history, some of the worst atrocities of human history have been done by people with a clear conscience. Do you realize that? In this very area, in this very area, do you know what the Nazi soldiers, does anyone here know that as Nazi soldiers came and, I don't know, dropped bombs around here or at least down there in London, that they tried to take over this very place? Do you know what was written on the belt buckles of every single one of those Nazi soldiers as they came here? Do you know? God meant us. God with us. Oh, they were clear, weren't they? We must lift up the word of God and not let false fires or, or false things or even the sight of something genuine be taken to a place that's not according to the word of God. But not according to the word of God. Revival many times brings in a break. It brings in an area, it breaks down some structures, particularly in areas of, of in Africa and there, in different places. We read about Jonathan Goforth in China and those different places. It breaks when you, when you break the medicine man down, the witch doctor, you sort of messed up the whole area, right? You sort of messed up the way they relate to the forest. You messed up all these different places. And then the church of the living God should come in there and I was stunned by a, a book. This book was, it's a novel, actually, if you, if you allow me. But the point that this man made in this novel about this boy, it, it stirred me. It was made by, it was written in the early 19, uh, early, the late 1940s by a man by the name of Alan Pat. It is called Cry of the Beloved Country. And it was talking about the apartheid in Johannesburg in South Africa. This is an interesting book because it shows a multi-generational time there, after, long after the revival of South Africa, and long after the thing there, and now apartheid is down in South Africa. And now you have some used to be native, actually converts, and now they have become ministers out of the rural area. And, and this one minister was now having the, the awful task of going to Johannesburg to find 
finds Clive Stan and his sister, who had, his sister was sold into prostitution and drugs, and little did he know at the time, but his son had been involved in a murder, and, and the sin of his prodigal son was to shame him. And one of the times, this minister, this one minister is with another minister, and he's just moaning over the state. He's there in Johannesburg, and he's out of the country church somewhere. And he's just spawned by the sin. And he's telling this other one that the local man in Johannesburg, the minister in Johannesburg, says this. It's a study. It's a novel. If you allow me, but the analogy is powerful. My friend, I'm a Christian. This is the one minister, the experienced minister, saying to the country minister that's going to look for his private son and sister. I'm a Christian. It is not in my heart to hate the white man. It was the white man that brought my father out of darkness. But you will pardon me if I talk frankly to you. The tragedy is not that things are broken. The tragedy is that they are not mended again. The white man has broken the tribe. And it is my belief, and again, I ask your pardon, that it cannot be mended again. I'm afraid that this guy is free. Back to him. But the house that is broken, these are the tragic things. That is why children break the law and old white people get robbed and beaten. He passed his hand across his brow and he says this. It suited the white man to break the tribe. He continued gravely. But it has not suited him to build something in the place of what is broken. I have pondered this for many hours and I must speak it. It is the truth for me. Well, they are not also. There are some white men who give their lives to build a voice broken. I've been in my nuts. They are afraid. That is the truth. It is fear. The rules of life. As God brings forth his truth in his life, he desires his church to feed and to minister. He desires local pastors to rise up. He desires the local church to take these revivals, to take these pouring out of God. God wants to send a Pentecost, and he wants to send it again, and he wants to send it again, but he wants to rise up a people that can take that and shepherd that and bring people into righteousness, into holy living. When, when Peter was there at the very end of the Gospel of John, and Jesus cried him to test him, what was his test to him there? Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, you know I love you. What if you do? Then feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, you know I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Jesus brings forth these beautiful things. I believe the Holy Spirit brings forth revival for a reason. He brings it to awake the church, to awake the church and to prepare the church. Jesus said in Matthew 28, at the very end, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen, it says. In closing, open your Bible to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, chapter 7. Remember Shiloh again. You see, Shiloh happened, but God remembers it, and he wants to, to mark something in that Ichabod. He wants that phrase, Ichabod, to be reminded, to be remembered by you. He wants you to groan over what happens when the holiness and the glory of God is departed. And he says it through his prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to read start the verses there. This is the word of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, and ye of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doing, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Now listen now, because we have a lot of fake things. Listen now. Trust
trust not in lying words. Saying this, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Listen to that. Trust not in people just saying, look at this and this. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. If this certain movement, if this certain thing, if this certain thing, isn't this place almost like you can hear it try to just stir up something, you know, stir up something. Don't trust in that. For if you thoroughly, here's how it comes, for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doing, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fathers, and the widow, and shed not his blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your friend, then will I cause you to dwell in this place. In the land that I gave you to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that can not profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and for an instance to bail and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name. And say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. In this house, which is called by my name. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says 